Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here on a day on which we've seen a historic political split with the departure of seven MPs from Labour and the formation of a breakaway party, the Independent Group. That does sound a bit like an online newspaper. But apart from that, the no longer secret seven are undoubtedly heading for the centre ground of politics. And they are, I suspect, the sort of people, liberals, who we're discussing tonight in connection with the rise of populism. There are populists in power in 11 European countries, whether it's Viktor Orban in Hungary or La Lega and Five Star in Italy. 20 years ago, the populist share of the vote was in single digits. Now, one in four votes cast in nat national elections in Europe is for a populist party. Look around the world and you can point to Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil or Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, and I haven't even mentioned Donald J. Trump. There are populists on the old right and the left of the political divide. What do they stand for? And is it liberals who've brought about this shift in political thinking? Well, let's meet our panel who are going to thrash this out. Elif Shafak is a political scientist by training. She's also an award-winning novelist and the most widely read female writer in Turkey. Her work's been translated into 50 languages and she contributes to the FT, The Guardian and The New York Times and other publications around the world. John Simpson is the BBC's World Affairs Editor. He's reported from 140 countries, interviewed around 200 world leaders and covered 46 wars on four continents. Matthew Goodwin is Professor of Politics and International Relations at Kent University and a Senior Visiting Fellow at Chatham House. He's been studying populist movements for over a decade and his latest book is the best-selling National Populism, The Revolt Against Liberal Democracy. And Daniel Hannan is a prominent Brexit campaigner and Conservative MEP for South East England. He's a prolific journalist and the author of nine books, including What Next? How to Get the Best from Brexit. Welcome to you all. I think we should begin by getting our terminology straight. There's a, a lot to disagree about just in terms of what it is we're actually talking about. So I want to ask each of you briefly, how do you define populism? Matthew. Uh, well, when I think of populism, national populism in particular, I think of a movement that wants to prioritize the interests and the culture of the nation state and defend a people uh, who it argues are being held in contempt or neglected by distant and often self-serving elites. National interest versus, if you like, uh, elites that have, are unelected often. Yeah, indeed. I think the distinction between left-wing and right-wing populism, for example, left-wing populism would frame the people along the lines of class solidarity. National populism would typically define the people in terms of an ethnic solidarity or an ethno-cultural solidarity, and that's the point of distinction between the two, but they each argue that the elite is responsible for all that has gone wrong in society. Elif. Well, I think populism is the, um, is the wrong answer to some very real and very genuine problems. And it's a bit like a, a bird with one wing. Uh, it's an ideology, but because it can't fly with one wing, it needs another wing to support it. And usually the other wing is another ideology. In some cases, that's socialism, but in most of the cases, it's nationalism. So it has to be accompanied by something else. But basically, it's a divisive ideology. Uh, it divides the society into two imaginary, homogenous camps, the people versus the elite. And it acts as if the people have a single voice, have a single will. Actually, one of my favorite stories is um, when, you know, as you know, with the French Revolution, Robespierre, when they came to power in the name of the people, after a while he started saying, I am the people, and after a while he started slaughtering the people in the name of the people. While all of that was happening, uh, there, there was an interesting debate in France. They wanted to erect a statue of the people on Pont Neuf. But the problem is, how do you depict the people? Is it a man? Is it a woman? Is it old? Is it young? Is it fat? Is it thin? You know, what is the people? So that illusion of a homogenous whole with regards to the people is, is a central thing. And secondly, populism likes to act as if the elite is also a homogenous whole. Um, in fact, despite their rhetoric, I think um, populists do not have a problem with the elite as long as they are the elite. So essentially, it is an anti-liberal, anti-pluralistic, and eventually, eventually it will get there. It is an anti-democratic ideology. 
Daniel Hannan. Yeah, I think there's a lot in what Elif just said. The, the classic definition of populism that we're for real people against an undefined elite is by its nature very difficult to pin down. It's worth saying that this lack of specificity also exists among its critics. So very often populism, when people try and pin it down, simply means something that other people like but that I don't like, which could be tax cuts or tax rises, could be different policies on healthcare, immigration, but it basically means a popular thing that I think is wrong, and therefore that's why the word is spat out, populist, like, like someone who's like a, like a teenager who's mistakenly taken a swig from the beer can that was being used as the ashtray, you know, populist. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't get you very far. What I think is the, the more interesting question is, who are the liberals that we're talking about? We'll come to that because, in a minute. But I, if, if I may, just, just the, for me, liberal, I, I mean, I would call myself a liberal in the classic sense, in the, in the tradition of, you know, J.S. Mill and before that, the, the, the proto-liberals, John Milton and, and John Locke and so on. But I think in the way that you introduced it, Rittler, liberal is now used to mean either kind of Davos crony capitalists or a kind of uh, army of, of kind of complaining, um, you know, outreach workers from Hackney Council or something. It isn't actually used to mean what the word literally means, which is the elevation of the individual above the collective and an emphasis on personal freedom. I've got two for the price of one there. Uh, John, how would you define populism? I, I don't think that populism is a proper ism. I think it's uh, an expression that we use to describe uh, a, a set of emotions, anger being a, a, a prime one, resentment and so forth, um, which uh, exists in a number of different countries for what I would think of as historical reasons, reasons uh, created by the historical moment through which we're living. When you actually speak to uh, people like the Front National in, in, in France or the, uh, the uh, Alternative für Deutschland and, and, and the various other groups, those that I have spoken to, they of course uh, approve in general terms of each other, but there's no real link, there's no populist kind of movement that sweeps across uh, America, Britain, uh, the, the continent, uh, Turkey, and so forth. It's, a, it's a, a, a response which is individual to the individual companies, countries. And of course, like so many of these kind of, uh, of movements, they've been used by people who've got a real, real serious agenda. Uh, whether Donald Trump has a, a real agenda under, uh, except for himself and Trumpism, I, 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 I don't know. But in, in this country, clearly, well, I mean, let's actually, before we turn to this country, let's think about, um, about Turkey. It's being used really essentially uh, by Erdogan for his own political purposes, just as populism in a different sense in Russia is being used by Putin for his own political purposes. And I, I personally believe that, that Brexit was used, uh, that, that Brexiteers used populism, our version of populism, to create the kind of ends that they wanted to. These things will not last in historical terms. These big movements come up and they fade away, like in Pujadism in France in the 50s. But while they're here, they're very, very serious indeed, and we cannot but take, adv take, uh, take account of them. So quite a few different ideas now that we've got into the mix, but Alif, whilst we're st let's stay with definitions for a little, little bit longer, liberal, what is a liberal? Do you agree with Daniel's definition? You know, <clears throat> I will answer your question, but as I was listening uh, to the other panelists, I, I want to make a confession. I have to share this with you. Um, as a writer, as a novelist, I'm, I'm very used to, you know, as a writer who believes in freedom of speech and the importance of diversity and minority rights, I'm very used to defending liberal values and liberal democracy in a country like Turkey, where sadly today there is no freedom of speech and minority rights are just constantly being trampled upon and there's zero appreciation for diversity. So against that background, I'm, I'm very used to defending liberal democracy. But I never thought, you know, I would feel the need to defend liberals and liberal values 
here in London, in the heart of the country that has given us some of the biggest and earliest liberal political philosophers in world history. So it feels a little bit surreal uh, for me. But we are where we are, it's the year 2019, um, and we have to discuss this. I think it is going to be one of the major debates in front of us. So I'm glad that we are organizing this, and also I'm glad that there's a nuance, there are lots of nuances in our, on our panel, because we are being more and more pulled into angry, antagonistic tribes, and we have to find a way to smash that duality. That duality is not good for anyone, and we need to smash it wisely and calmly and with utter respect for each other, even when we disagree. That's one thing I want to get out of my chest. And the second thing is, um, you know, I... I think the word liberal is today the most misunderstood and misinterpreted word in the English language, as we're speaking. And nobody, nobody wants to be called a liberal. You know, I have friends in America, writers, journalists, academics. Yeah, nobody. No, I do. I'm very happy to call myself a liberal. In, 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 um, when, when, you when, you when you talk to these people, you know, they, they say, don't, don't call me a liberal. Um, they want to be called progressive. So there's also a lot of criticism coming um, from as you move from one country to another, the definition of liberal changes, and we need to bear that in mind. But of course, most of the criticism today comes from the right, yeah? from the far right, from the populist right. And that attack is quite vague. So anyone and anything that disagrees with their views is being lumped together in a basket and labeled as liberal. And that won't do. We need to unpack that. Actually, my, my favorite definition is by Rush Limbaugh, this far right, um, right-wing radio host, he, he calls liberals the New York theater and arts and croissants crowd. So if you happen to enjoy theater and arts and literature and, and the croissant next to a coffee, you too might be a liberal. Matthew Goodwin, I, when was the last I, time I, you had a croissant? <laughs> Confessions are sorry, but no, in terms of then being a liberal, it, Daniel's happy to sign up. For mm. others, it's a term of abuse. In the context of this conversation, are these people, these croissant-eating elite, are they, are they the ones that should be blamed if there is blame to be shared? Perhaps you disagree with the idea of blame for the rise of the populace. No, I think liberals are partly to blame for the rise of populism. I've put my cards on the table. I think, uh, in particular, a certain strand within liberalism has got things terribly wrong. And I, I would take a slightly different view of uh, this evening's discussion. I'm amazed that we're nearly three years on from the political shocks of 2016 with Trump and Brexit and all that we've seen else, elsewhere um, uh, across the channel in Europe, um, that it's taken liberals in general terms so long to reflect on why we're here and what might have gone wrong with the liberal project. And I found it amazing that um, liberals have thrown comfort blankets all over themselves over the last two or three years, that all of these seismic shocks are about social media and big tech, the legacy of the financial crash, what was written on the side of a bus, shadowy figures controlling what we see on Facebook and Twitter. We've just heard that populism is a temporary blip. It will be gone as quickly as it's arisen. We've heard that populism is against everything, that it's not for something. And the general view, I think, uh, has been just get this thing out of here. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to reflect about it. I don't want to take into account, for example, the, the possibility that it might have a distinctive tradition of thought in its own right, that it might be offering people an instrumental um, opportunity to vote for something, such as national, uh, national identity, such as tradition, such as belonging, um, that it might actually be rooted in some things that liberals have got very wrong, the economic settlement being one, the obsession with individualism being another. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that in general terms, I'm sure we can unpack parts of this, um, liberals are to blame for the rise of populism. Well, Daniel, you're, you're signing up to liberalism, and yet you're, all, this is being, sorry, all this is being laid at your door. Well, that's why I was being very strict about defining terms. By liberal, I mean it in the exact sense, in the etymological sense of an emphasis on freedom. I don't mean it as anyone who eats a croissant, right? That's, that, it, it gets to the point where it means nothing if you're just using it as a kind of term to mean, you know, uh, elites. But to answer the question, are liberals to blame? I mean, I think the proximate cause 
for the changes in politics that we've seen in much of Europe and in the US, not in every Western country, it hasn't happened in Canada, it hasn't happened in Australia, but the, the rise of a more authoritarian type of, of politics was the, the financial crash or rather the mistaken response to it. Uh, we saw the better part of a trillion pounds taken from low and medium income families through the tax system to bail out some very wealthy bankers and bondholders and rescue them from the consequences of their own mistakes. And that seemed, for the first time in my life, to vindicate what had until then always struck me as a quite fringe left position, which is that the capitalist system is really rigged, it's about the rich staying rich, it's not meritocratic. For the first time in my life, there, there appeared to be an element of truth in that argument. I think we will look back at the bailouts as, a, as a, a, a calamitous mistake. I don't think that's the only thing going on, but I think that was the immediate trigger. But Matthew, you're saying this is about family and flag and faith. It's got nothing to do with, with perhaps 2008. That sort of, those ideas have their roots much further back. No, so I, I, I would agree with um, uh, Dan that the financial crisis exacerbated a lot of the uh, divides that we're now grappling with, but the root causes go back much further. Anybody who's been looking at Europe knows that this really began in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and I think there's a lot of truth to the claim that what we are witnessing partly is a backlash to the great liberal revolutions of the 1960s. And don't get me wrong, I'm not here just to bash liberals. I think liberalism has obviously has achieved a lot of wonderful things, and you know I'm on board with much of what liberalism is about, but every liberal in the room would probably accept, and if they don't, I'd be keen to hear why, that their ideology is increasingly being hijacked by a strain of thought that has no interest in the classical liberal principles that Dan just referred to, that is absolutely obsessed with turning everybody and everything into a victim, with historical injustices, with cultural appropriation, with describing everybody as a fascist, everybody's a Nazi. We're not interested at all in having any reasoned discussion whatsoever about things that are happening today. And that strand of thought, which has sort of aligned itself to the liberal left and hijacked large parts of the liberal left, that is what is really putting populism on steroids. Alicia Fack, I was going to mention Steve Bannon there, who certainly identified the idea that, let's call it identity politics, was rather good for his brand of, of populism, if you want to call it that. I think I, I, there's, a, there's a huge conceptual chaos, you know, out there, and it's, it's, it's like a fog, and everything and every, everything is just, just lumped together. We need to differentiate that classical liberal philosophy that asks basic questions, and, and I think one of the most important questions is who exercises power over us individuals? If it's the government, that government power should never be absolute, it should never be totally uncontrolled, there should be checks and balances. If it's a society, there should never be a tyranny of the majority, you know, we should be careful. If there is more subtle forces of power, so just following that line of power that classical liberal thinkers were asking, that is something else, and what we're talking about and what is happening ever since 1970s onwards, which is neoliberalism, is something completely different. We need to differentiate these two things. This market-driven ideology and greed that has left the... Um, the that expects the public sector to completely follow the rules of the private sector and subsidize the private sector, that is something else. So I think we need to be careful. Um, when you say Steve Bannon, it's not a coincidence that Steve Bannon and Marine Le Pen and many, many populists today, they call themselves Democrats. They don't have a problem with the word democracy or being called democrat. It's not a coincidence that the populist party in Sweden is Swedish populist party or in, or in Slo you know, many other countries. It is the liberal component of liberal democracy at this stage they have a problem with. Yeah? So by that I mean rule of law, separation of powers, free media, independent academia, minority rights. If you get all these components out, and you end up with only the ballot box. That regime, as we've seen in Turkey, as we've seen in Hungary and we're seeing in Poland and many other examples right now, that regime turns into majoritarianism. And once majoritarianism kicks in, from there into authoritarianism, it's a very short slide. So in a nutshell, democracy needs those liberal components and liberalism as a philosophy needs democracy. They complement each other. But what we're experiencing is a divorce, a divergence of these two.
And John, we're talking about whether liberals should be blamed for the rise of populism, but at the same time, is, it, is this what Elif's describing, the perhaps undermining of democratic principles, the rule of law, rights, rational inquiry, the open society and so on, is that what makes liberals very uncomfortable with the rise of populism, a desire to dismiss it because it's somehow unpicking the fabric of, of, uh, of what they see as the fundamentals of democracy? Yeah, well, I'm sure that's true. Um, the fact is, though, uh, you, you asked us originally what uh, to give some definition of liberalism, and what we haven't yet heard uh, from anybody here is that liberalism has given us for 60 years of peace and, and prosperity on an extraordinary scale. The principle of internationalism, the uh, growth of relations between countries, the uh, linking of countries together has proved to be the greatest boon in, in human history. And that we, it's fading now, it's starting to break up because liberalism, as I maintain, uh, populism will. Liberalism is also starting to crack. That's the, the way that human beings run their lives. And, History is, a, is an extension of that, uh, of that um, uh, approach. But the essence of what we've had, we've had it extraordinarily good. A billion people lifted out of, out of poverty in the last 15 years. But why shouldn't Quite that continue? Why shouldn't that go on? Why shouldn't, uh, if you like, the, the eruption of populism, actually the chaos that ensues, create an opportunity, sort of, you know, schumpeter, creative destruction, and something new and, and vibrant emerges from it? Well, perhaps it will. I mean, no doubt, no doubt it will. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, the, the, uh, what's created this is that liberal international it's, it's instinct. It's important to tease out two things here. There is a kind of globalization that is about lifting barriers, allowing goods and services to cross borders, and that indeed has lifted a billion people out of poverty, is, is achieving the most extraordinary things all over Asia and Africa, and I agree, has led to and a, our a, own country. But that is a very, and indeed here, and, and with the, 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 the biggest benefits proportionately felt by the, the poorest people, so it, it's something I hope we can all agree is a good thing. But we should be careful before eliding that into, and therefore we want more powerful global technocracies with more and more power to overrule democratic governments, because that is the opposite of lifting barriers out of people's way. That is about imposing barriers, and often doing so in policy areas which would not have succeeded had they had to go through national legislatures. And so we shouldn't make the mistake. Now, this is something that populists do. It was very striking listening to uh, Marine Le Pen that she elided the two things together all the time. She was against globalization, both in terms of, of, of free trade and free markets and in terms of you know, the European and, and UN type uh, technocracies. But they're two incredibly different and I would argue antithetical things because one is about liberating people, taking uh, making them freer from state coercion, and the other is about imposing more rules. What, what I would, where I think you and I might agree uh, quite strongly is... Don't agree is, too much. No, no, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to make that mistake again. But, but um, where I think we would agree is that what has damaged uh, the uh, European project so much in country after country, and this country more than most, is was that drive to unite Europe, to put it together, to lift the, lift the boundary, raise the boundaries, to allow more and more countries to come in, a kind of Europeanizing principle which ran far ahead of what the, the citizens of uh, the, the, the various European countries wanted or were prepared to, to look up. That, in my terms, is not liberalism. That's, that's, that's bonapartism. I mean, sure. that's driving these things through. But the and liberal... But this, is, this is Matt's point. No one, since the referendum here, I've been in Brussels in the intervening two and a half years, and there are various kind of approved, acceptable responses to Brexit. Disbelief, oh, they'll never really do it. Rage, led astray by demagogues, or, or kind of contempt, just you wait. You know, or the one thing we couldn't the, be so stupid. The one thing that nobody, that nobody is allowed to say in Brussels is, oh, 
I wonder why they voted leave. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder whether we might have behaved differently ourselves. I wonder whether anyone else might vote leave. If they were. So there's been an absolute refusal to engage in any self-analysis, because of course it's much easier just to demonise anyone that you disagree with. I promised we wouldn't spend the evening talking about Brexit, but whilst we're here, is it populism? Is a vote to Brexit populist? Uh, Part of it, but, but by no means all of it. Um, just to give you one stat to, to reflect on, I mean, only about 60, only about six in 10 leavers had previously expressed any interest at all in voting for the UK Independence Party, yet we're still routinely told that this was essentially a sort of uh, populist um, project. And we're also routinely told, I mean, the, you know, again, to go back to my point about comfort blankets, that this is all about you know, big tech, social media, Robert Mercer. I mean, you know, the fact, some of the coverage of, of how people ended up voting leave has just been remarkable to me, completely detached from the evidence. Um, but but it, it, it's everything that happened in June 2016. That's basically where the causal mechanism is to be found. And we've just completely lost sight of the 30 or 40 years of research that we have showing why Brits were so Eurosceptic and why they felt that the European project hadn't gone uh, uh, in the way that they were initially told uh, that, that it was going to go. And this has been wrapped up into a broader problem for liberals, which I'll leave on the table and we can reflect on, which is this tendency to absolutely catastrophize everything. Everything's got to be catastrophized. Brexit is populism, Trump is fascist. Um, there's absolutely no room for nuance. And the criticism of populism, as we've heard, is it's binary and it shuts things down into black and white terms, and that's, that's correct. But liberals are very prone to doing the same thing, which is that there are no legitimate grievances here. Everything is evil, everything is bad, that's, that's, that's everything is negative. That's, that's not true, you see, uh, and I think that is really the sad thing about our times. We are being constantly told that we have only two options in everything. You know, it's either this extreme or that extreme. And I think we have much more options than that. So you might be very critical, in my opinion, we should be very critical of populist demagogues who are exploiting, using and abusing some very genuine grievances, some very genuine problems. I make a difference between them and the people who for very genuine reasons, because they have worries, they have concerns, and they are right to have concerns. We need to talk about inequality. I mean, finally, inequality is now at the center of our debates in the year 2019. You know, um, for such a long time, it was just on the, on the fringes. In uh, two, 1928, the 1%, you know, the richest 1% could expect to capture around 15% of the, of the wealth, of the income, in 1928. In 19, 2000, sorry, 2018, last year, the same 1% got more than 82% of the entire money generated. I'm talking across Europe. There is a huge inequality that we need to talk about. When I look at the median household income in America, it has been clearly stagnant, flat, since 1985. So there is that dimension, that huge economic inequality. But I'm not only talking about that, the anxiety. The anxiety of losing your job, the anxiety of not knowing what tomorrow might bring, the anxiety of, of thinking maybe my children are not going to have the same opportunities. These are very real things. And no one think? has the right to belittle these grievances. Indeed. But While I respect agree, those grievances, yeah. I might be very critical of the populist demagogues who are exploiting those grievances. But, so I make a distinction then. But if, if, if we accept the idea that this is, these are issues that are being exploited by populist demagogues, why do you think liberals haven't alighted upon them? Thomas, Tom Frank published Listen Liberal in 2016 before the election of Trump, and he argued in that that the Democratic Party, which had once been the party of the people, exactly. had been kind of co-opted by a managerial class. And they were affluent city dwellers, suburbanites. You know, they believed in opportunity and meritocracy, but actually they weren't willing to yeah. give up what they already had in order yeah. to make those things possible. So, so this is why we have to make a distinction. Again, when we're talking about elite, it is not elite, it's elites. The elites can be of liberal values, they might have a liberal worldview. The elites can, be, ha, can have conservative views, and as we're seeing right now, the elites can have also populist views. And just like Pareto wrote long time ago, there's a circulation of elites right now going on. We have to differentiate that. There were many liberals, people on the left, people on the right, saying, you know what, this inequality, this is not fair, this is not right. There have been many people talking about that, but their voices were never heard by the elites, by mainstream 
mainstream politicians. We need to make that distinction. But if we lump together everything under the label of liberal, we won't get too far. But there's, there's something else going on, and this, the, this is a bit that I really worry about, which is um, there's a YouGov poll two weeks ago that asked Remainers and Leavers, um, would you be okay if a relative brought home somebody from the other political tribe? Okay, so if a lever brought home a remainer or a remainer brought home a lever. And 11% of levers said, I, I would have a problem actually if a relative brought home a, a remainer. 37% of remainers said, I would have a problem if a relative brought home a lever. Now, how can we explain the difference between the two? I'd suggest that what that gives us is yet more evidence that we have the, of the fact that liberals can be as intolerant of other political beliefs and other ideas as populists can be. And so when I ask the question to, you know, and I would say I'm generally a, a liberal, um, but, but when I ask this question to many of my liberal friends, which is, okay, after 2016, what are you willing to concede? Are you going to concede some major reforms on inequality? Are you going to concede some immigration reform? Are you going to concede that we need to radically renew our political institutions because they are not very representative of the people who are voting for populists? And the usual response is nothing. Why should we concede? We're not going to concede anything. And it's the intolerance within a section of liberalism that I think is going to make the situation a lot worse. But is that not simply because the issues are so serious? This is not just an academic question. This is the, 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 the actual way in which we live our lives. And as you say, the, the, the amount of money we earn, whether we're going to be able to feed our children. This is not something you can just say, um, oh, well, I take one view, you take the other. I'm sure we can find a, a middle ground. This is serious stuff. So what? what? May, may I? Sorry, everyone, everyone thinks that. I mean, who, who wouldn't say, I, well, I believe my, my view? But, but, but Matt's point is there is an extraordinary unwillingness from the people who are the first to say we believe in tolerance and accepting other points of view, actually to, to respond with incredulity when, an, when another point of view is actually put forward. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about some of the more intolerant opinions, aren't we, on the other side as well? I would give you a real-world example, and I'm breaking all of our rules about not talking endlessly about Brexit, Brexit. but um, <laughs> here's, here's how the last two and a half years could have gone. We could have had Remain politicians leaving London and going to coastal communities and saying, hang on, why have these areas not had any inward investment for 30 years? We could have had people saying, where should we move the House of Lords? And should we replace it and make it democratically elected? We could have had people saying, which big institutions of financial power should we move to Gateshead or to Wales? Uh, or we should have people maybe of asking, asking, why are only 3% of MPs um, coming from a background of manual work? compared to 18% who have only ever worked in politics. We could have had a really interesting national discussion about where the settlement has gone wrong, and we haven't. What we had was a lot of people saying, get this thing out of here, I don't want to deal with it, I don't want to reflect on the grievances. And they that's, say, well, we could have done that. I'm no, sorry, it's these, true. Are, no, these no, are it's... massive generalization. It's not true, you know? I don't, I... So why didn't it happen? It's, it's not true. Um, again, we're making huge, huge generalizations. You know, if you ask that question in another country, formulated in a different way, you might have got some different answers. Let's look at the discourse, the rhetoric of um, leaders, people leading populist movements in different countries. What are they saying? There is a reason why many of them like culture wars. Populism benefits from people being divided into groups, us versus them. And the more angry we get at each other, the better it is for the demagogues at the top. So we need to be very careful about not falling into this trap. There is a reason why, you know, remember one of Trump's uh, speeches. To me, it was like Erdogan speaking. I couldn't believe my ears. He said, the important thing is for us to unify the people. As for the other people, they don't matter. Right? Uh, Nigel Farage, after the Brexit vote, one of the first things he said was the real people, the decent people have spoken. So if there's a real people, then there's also the opposite, an unreal people. Who are they? The, I can give you many examples. There's always a division between, you know, these people are better pure vis-a-vis -vis other people. We have to be very careful I'm not, about I'm not, not falling I, I'm not into disputing, that trap of I'm not disputing any of that, but I'm saying that the obsession with the populist demagogues is... is um, is distracting everybody. The populist demagogues are important, but we are obsessing about them. What, my question to you is, 
How do you respond seriously to the grievances well, that are fueling you. populism? Well, I'm telling you, I think the system is not sustainable. This tool, even the, the left versus right divisions, we need to move beyond that. We need, we need to reform our politics. We need to reform our tax system. We need to talk about inequality sincerely, honestly. There are lots of things that need to change. And also, there are some other elements that we haven't touched upon, like demographics. You know, we need to talk about anxiety. I understand anxiety so well. Maybe, maybe it's because I am an anxious person and myself. I know how one form of anxiety triggers other forms of anxiety. Yeah? But it's so, not going to happen because of the anger that's created within our societies. It's not going to happen if it, you don't move beyond our echo chambers. It is our duty uh, to well, communicate, to connect, right, to right, listen, one, one way of to doing learn. That, one way of doing that time, is to take seriously the reasons that people themselves the, give. The, for vote. So the, the classic the, response when people Brexit. move from vote for, I'm not talking about Brexit, when people vote for Trump, Le Pen or whatever, mm -hmm. the classic response is to say, what were they really voting for? Let's diagnose some subconscious reason that they weren't aware of okay. to do with economic decline. And that is, of course, exactly the kind of patronizing attitude that has driven people into being angry in the first place. They were, they, let, let's take seriously what they say they're interested in and see whether there is a way of addressing it. But is the underlying assumption in, in what both of you are saying that the populists have the answer? I don't think uh, populist movements have the answer. I agree with some of what you were saying that they do bend the question to a different outcome, absolutely. But there are unquestionably some very big legitimate grievances that people have over the representativeness of our political institutions, over the economic settlement, and over the pace of demographic change. I mean, why, why in response, um, you know, in terms of where Europe is going over the next 50, 50 years to, to 100 years, contrary to, to the idea that we're witnessing a sort of Pujadist uh, sequel, um, Everything that I see that's driving support for populism, and I've read pretty much every study that there's been, says there are two ingredients to this. One is very strong distrust of established politicians, but by far the most important is anxiety over the pace and scale of demographic change. Now, those two things, as liberal politicians increasingly turn in on themselves and become less representative, and as our societies continue to experience very rapid demographic change, those things will sharpen. So if we don't begin to answer the questions soon, then actually they may begin to outflank us to a much greater so degree. So what we're talking about is immigration, is black people coming from Africa and arriving in Europe, and, and European and nations... And, and, and Europeans and, and, coming to, to, to Britain. Britain. I mean, these, these were real serious issues which, I mean, I think it's only fair to say that the liberal instinct, as it were, was to, was to cover over, not to notice. I mean, the, essentially, the Blairite response was to say, it's actually good for you in the long run. Who do you think's going to uh, serve you in, 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 in cafes? Who's going to do the hard work? Who's going to clean the, 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 the windows? We have to have these people in. And I don't want to hear anything from you that, that, that is critical because that's a, that's a bad response and uh, that is certainly true. There's no doubt about it. But, Richard, you asked a really interesting question which is do the populists have the answer which, which no one has, has tried to answer yet so let me have a go. Right? The problem is, these, the, the, the problems are created, we all agree about you know, the yeah. sense that there's a, a dislocated elite that people don't feel represents them. And then I would say this has been the story of almost every populist movement going back to the Gracchi brothers in Rome. What they say is, when we get our people in, it'll be different because we will have real people, mm -hmm. right? Authentic, genuine people, and they will be different from these out of touch, shadowy, half foreign elites, right? And of course, what happens every time is they get in and they use the power of the state to reward a different set of followers, but nothing is actually solved. Happening. Starting exactly. in, now, the real solution, I would argue, is instead of getting a different bunch of people in to snatch at the levers of control, is to try and diffuse power, decentralize, disperse, democratize power, so that the issue of who is controlling becomes less of a problem. Yes, you know, but Daniel, if that were the kind of solution that uh, comes out of human nature and so forth, we would have seen it again and again and again. The Gracchi and everybody down to Erdogan would, uh, would behave rather better. The fact is they don't. 
those kind of, uh, those kind of movements do not throw up that kind of response. No, of course they don't. That's, that's, that's why the correct thing, it seems to me, for a responsible policymaker is to say, instead of giving people a choice between, as it were, Macron and Le Pen, or a choice between Clinton and Trump, can't we do better? Can't we have a, an option which is about restoring the supremacy of actual liberalism, the supremacy of the individual, the supremacy of localized decision-making, so that the, uh, the issues that drove populism in the first place, the sense of disenfranchisement, are addressed. Ellie, Good luck. You, you, you know, <laughs> in, um, uh, the year before, the, the Freedom House, uh, I'm sure you've seen the results, when they looked across the east and west everywhere, 72 countries have been sliding backwards. In 72 countries, civil liberties, political rights are today in danger. You might say, well, some countries have made progress as well. Yes, 35 countries have made progress, but twice as many have been sliding backwards. My motherland is one of those countries. And for me, this debate is not an abstract theoretical debate. I have seen it happen. First gradually, and then with a bewildering speed. I have seen what happens when populists come to power in Turkey, in Hungary, in Poland, how they place their own cronies in constitutional court, change the entire judiciary, you know, that's one of their first aims. How they change the electoral system, and then the media becomes the enemy of the people. There are, of course, differences as you move from one country to another, but there are amazing similarities which we should be aware of. Yeah? And, and that is why I think we should all be concerned. Whether you're voting Labour or, or Tories, it, it is beyond that, you know? What we're facing is losing the coexistence, is losing the harmony that has been binding us together. And just to give you one example, the distortion is so deep. Uh, when, the, when the elections were going on in France, uh, maybe you've seen Macron, like many other politicians, he goes out on the street, he's talking to people, and he goes into a fish factory, he's talking with the, with the workers, and he sees an eel, a fish, and he starts gutting the, the eel with the worker, and they work together. And then, of course, his hands are messy, you know, dirty, he goes and washes his hands, right? That's it, that's the video. Uh, a far-right site took that video and edited the video. So they took out the eel, the fish, that, that detail is gone, and they took the previous scene and replaced it with a posterior scene. So that in this new video, Macron goes to a factory, he, he shakes hand with a worker, he looks at his hands and he says, I've just, you know, touched a worker, and then he goes and washes his hands. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because we are losing the truth, the norms. You know, we can always have disagreements, but if the truth is being eroded, that should concern all of us. This kind of systematic distortion is very new. One quick then question before we open it up to the floor is the legacy, which is I think where you're going, Alif, with this, of populism to weaken democracy ultimately. Well, this country, I think, has much less of a problem than almost anywhere in Europe. We're very unusual in not having an anti-immigrant populist party in the main chamber of our legislature. We're also, according to all the opinion polls, the most pro-immigration country in Europe, uh, in the sense that when people are asked, do you take a positive or a very positive view, we, we come out above all the other big countries, in fact, in all the other countries in, in the, the data that I've seen. Uh, and the interesting thing to me, and it runs so totally contrary to the media narrative of the last two years that a lot of people in the audience will shake their heads disbelievingly when I say this, but the, the, the data is there, we've become much more pro-immigration over the last 30 months. But, so you could say... the question I was asking. I was saying, is the, is the legacy of all of this, whatever the causes, whatever the way in which it manifests itself, ultimately to undermine the democratic ideals by which we have lived and voted for the last however many years? No, I mean, the, the, the problem is not democracy. With all of the, the horror stories that we're hearing from Turkey, and I, I completely agree with Elif, that there was a, a slow decline and then from about 2013, a sudden collapse. But the last thing to go has been democracy. The, the, the problem with Turkey is not that there are no elections, or that, or, or, it's, it's that, it's that the, the rule of law and the liberal order that sustains democracy has been hollowed out. That's a very narrow definition of democracy, though, isn't it? Well, elections. voting is, yeah, that's, well, that's yes, okay, it's a narrow but I think accurate that's one. That's what democracy means. Well, it also involves institutions and the rule of law and justice and various things No, like democracy that. doesn't just mean a good thing. It, 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 uh, you can have a democracy with bad outcomes. Democracy doesn't mean 
something I happen to agree with. So uh, in Hungary, in Turkey, in Poland, there have been all sorts of moves away from a liberal order. But I don't think anyone is arguing, certainly not in Hungary and Poland until very recently but, but in Turkey, that the elections were not, the, uh, you know, were, were invalid, that there was massive balance. There's something stuff. very inherent to, to, to populist ideology. If you think you represent the people, anyone who challenges you is the enemy of the people. You know, that mentality is right there from the very beginning. And this is why people like Kaczynski, for instance, in Poland, he calls the Poles who dare to criticize him. Those are the bad Poles that have the gene of treason betrayal in their, in their blood, he says. You can easily turn into a traitor in the eyes of the populists. Trump if they, isn't far well, if, you know, he's and, not and that far. And the reverse, so, Elif, as, as Matt was, was showing us with those statistics earlier, and the reverse, people are, are, can be every bit as intolerant the other way around. Okay, so on that note, I'm going to let you come back in a minute. I'm going to open the floor up to questions. Lots of hands going up already. Um, I'm just going to wait to find people with microphones. This lady at the front here... Um, I'd just like to add something to what John Simpson... <laughs> it's going to turn into a question. Um, uh, John Simpson said that um, people kind of ignored the effects of mass movement into Britain from, from the EU countries. Loads and loads of statistics in the, in the kind of right-thinking... in the bien-pensant press used to say... Well, yes, um, this, the advent of all these workers doesn't harm um, the economy except for the wages at the very bottom. And I would ask the panel um, what special place in hell is reserved for people who, who are so cavalier about the, very mo the most vulnerable in our society. Okay, thank you. And there was a... Yes. Earlier on in the discussion, Matthew Goodwin got dangerously close to actually answering the question posed by the debate, which is, should we and how can we blame liberals for the rise of populism? You're all addicted to going on about how awful these populist leaders are. We all know that. What's interesting is, to what extent are liberals to blame for this occurrence, this pan-national occurrence? I'd love to hear the panel just address that point, please. And there was one more, I think, just over there. Thank you. Um, I wonder what the panel felt about the impact of issues like climate change and our collective future, population growth and so on, on the rise of populism and the links possibly with migra increased migration um, that is likely to happen in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, should we, should we, is there a special place in hell for those who are rather cavalier about the impact of mass migration on the lowest paid? Should we blame liberals? We've been pussyfooting around, I'm told. And climate change and population growth, how much, in a sense, we can't get away from them, how much are they going to keep driving these political movements? I think that's what I understood your question to be. Um, Daniel, do you want to go first? Let me take the second one. Uh, I answered briefly in terms of the financial crisis, but I, I was going to go on to say I think there is something much deeper, uh, something whose explanations are to be found as much in the field of psychology as of politics. A lot of the liberal ideals which we were taught, which I guess most people in this room were taught from the day they went to school, don't come naturally. The idea that you should assess an idea on its own merits rather than on the basis of whether you like the person saying it is actually quite a counterintuitive one. We've all had to learn to do it and we've internalized it, but it is not something that comes naturally and people very easily revert to the kind of earlier tribal heuristic of I don't like you so everything you're saying must be wrong. People have a tendency to conspiracy theory and you know, in, in places where you don't have the, the, the closest correlation for where do you find conspiracy theories is how much higher education is there in that country? This is something that has to be educated out of people if you like. So I wonder whether we've not lived through a quite abnormal period, a liberal period, in which there is emphasis on individual rights and human rights, and there is also an emphasis on the norms and courtesies that make for a civil political discourse. But I wonder whether that isn't the unusual bit. So when people say, you know, there's never been such a hostile climate in an American presidential election as now, I mean, of course there has. You know, what about, what about Abraham Lincoln's election in 1860? Or what about, you know, the, uh, Jefferson in 1800 or whatever? Maybe, disquieting thought, maybe it was the late 20th century. 
that was the unusual period, because there was an external enemy in the form of the Cold War, because there was a surprising, uh, and indeed in America, a unique homogeneity, everyone having watched the same three TV channels and gone to the same schools and studied the same things. Uh, if we want to preserve the basic Enlightenment values of empiricism and it, value, you know, the, the, the emphasis on freedom and, and uh, individual thought and so on, we have to teach them. And when I said at the beginning, I, I'm happy to call myself a liberal in the tradition of Locke and, and Mill and Milton and so on, I don't think that those works are being nearly as widely taught as they once were. And if they're not, people are not going to intuit these ideas because they don't come naturally. They're running up against a million years of evolution. So unless we work hard to inculcate in people the value, the difficult value of listening to people that you don't like because they might still have something useful to say anyway, don't expect them to find their own way to that conclusion. Matthew. Well, uh, if I can weave some of the questions together, I recently finished um, reading Hillary Clinton's book, What Happened? And I got to the end and I realized she still doesn't know what happened. <laughs> in, in the sense that it was all about what had happened during that campaign. And there was absolutely no reflection to speak to your question about the bigger challenges that are facing the liberal left. And one of those challenges is linked to the other question about mass migration, which is that people do not only evaluate the health of the nation in terms of GDP. And this has run through the Trump campaign, the Brexit campaign, it runs through Europe that this utter obsession with reducing every debate down to economic costs and benefits um, is at odds with how most people view not only their national community, but also how they view uh, life uh, without be getting too deep, we are not wired to be self-interested uh, lemmings uh, in the way that many of our commentators would, would have us believe. And, and that's been revealed quite dramatically over the last few years. And again, the fact that we haven't answered your, the leading question as, as detailed as perhaps we should have done is because I still think we're in a state of shock collectively that people haven't yet been prepared to pull the curtains back and say, okay, actually, where did we go wrong here? And my worry is that's now being overtaken by, interestingly, that new ideology that I mentioned and nobody really picked up on, which is the way in which liberalism of the sort that, that Dan describes um, is being hijacked very quickly by people who claim to be liberals, but in fact are not liberal at all. Um, the more in common report that was recently released by the Joe Cox Foundation, um, the Hidden Tribes report, showed this very nicely, that there are three types of liberal, uh, liberals uh, in, in the US, and one of those tribes, which is the most noisy, the progressive liberals, are not interested in compromise, they're not interested in consensus, not interested in making society more fair or equal. They're interested in defining everybody as a victim and going on and on about historical injustices to the point that then they're surprised when white Americans say, well, gee, hang on, I'm a victim too. Maybe I'd quite like to get on board with this Donald Trump guy who's telling me I'm a, I'm a victim. My worry for liberals now is there's no unifying myth anymore. There's no unifying story anymore. There's nothing that is about bringing people together. It's all about differentiation. It's all about subdividing people into constantly evolving and new categories and groups. And then we sit around and we say, well, why is a communitarian, um, collectivist ideology on the march. I, gee, I don't understand. Because we're just obsessed with turning everybody into to individualistic what extent, limits. If you lay those criticisms at the door of liberals, why shouldn't you lay similar criticisms at the door of populists who have equally, are, as we've talked about othering, talking about uh, oh, defining yeah. themselves yeah. against other groups? It works both ways. Yeah, I mean, I think populists are ruthless, are manipulative. Um, are conceited, are very quick to turn questions into an ethnic, uh, or see all questions through, through an ethnic uh, lens. Um, but in a way, I'm less interested in the populists themselves. Like, you, we all know who Donald Trump is. I don't find Trump particularly interesting. What I find more interesting is the, is the complete failure of the Democrats to renew their ideological vision and their message. I mean, this, even today, the new party or the new faction in Parliament, what struck me about reading their statement uh, this morning was that it's completely absent of any idea. 
there's just no idea. There's nothing other than we don't really like Brexit. That's it. There's no passionate new case for you know, how to fix a settlement, how to renew the nation, how to renew the international order. There's just nothing there. And as Dan said, maybe we're at the point, you know, without sounding too macro about it all, but we've had human civilization for 5,000 years, we've had liberal democracy for 100 years, maybe we are at the point where actually an ideology is now just entering into its twilight year. Gosh, there's a big thought. John? I, I think the gentleman who, who asked us to actually address the question that's hanging so heavily over our heads is absolutely right, and we, we, we haven't. Um, I personally do not think it's liberalism or liberals who are responsible for the rise of populism. I think it's the, without wanting to sound too Marxist about it, I think it's the march of history. I think it's the direction of history. We saw something of the same thing in the 1880s and 1890s and the early 1900s, a sense of, of uh, that, that, that human existence was, uh, was, was improving all the time when in fact it, it, it wasn't. And I thought one of the things that Matthew said that was really, really attractive and it answers or it, it, it addresses itself to the, the lady who asks about the particular a, a place in hell. Um, of course, we should have responded by, by trying to work out what was wrong, where did we go wrong, and redress it, and change the way that our politics uh, are operating. That just ain't human nature. It's not what we're doing. And if you could examine all of this uh, sub specie aeternitatis, like God would, looking down, you'd say, oh God, they're added, well, I suppose God doesn't say, oh God, does he? But, but <laughs> they're, they're, uh, um, they're at it again. They work themselves up to uh, a, a point where they're doing extremely well, and then they, they screw it up for themselves because they're cloth-eared and they don't listen. Elif. I'll also try to connect the, the, the questions. You know, until not that long ago, when, when you look at the political parties, the MPs, politicians, many of them, those were, who were on the left, had very strong roots in trade unions, trade union culture, uh, the working class. And when you look at the politicians on the right side, many of them had very strong connections with the agricultural sector. They came from such families, or they knew people who were connected um, with that community. More and more, we see those bonds weakening, so much so that today in this country, only 3% of MPs are coming from a relatively um, lower class background, less privileged background. To put it more bluntly, I think we need to talk about how education is a major divide in this country. We need to talk about the class barriers. In other words, more and more MPs, politicians on both sides of the ideological spectrum are becoming similar to each other and becoming more and more disconnected from the people. I think that is one of our major problems. Another thing is this massive inequality that we need to talk, and it is the direct result of neoliberalism that was started in 1970s onwards and got worse and worse. This entire idea of the markets, you know, unrestrained, um, the, the, the corporate world, how that benefits, we, we need to talk about, you know, and to me this is a very liberal question, we need to trace the power, you know, who exercises power over us is a very legitimate question. A second thing that has been changing dramatically is demographics. This is affecting countries on the periphery of Europe, such as Bulgaria, where we are expecting a 27% decline in the population in the year 2050. That also means uh, an anxiety. You know, people are becoming worried that they are going to become a minority in their own countries. This is also a major question in America, in many states today, including in Texas and California. Uh, the white segment of the population has turned into a minority. This is not only because of immigration, it's also related to birth rates uh, among different groups. 
But in the year 2044, America is most probably going to become a minority-majority country. Maybe for me this is not a concern, but I can understand that this can be a concern for many people who are living very different lives. So we need to talk about demographics. And one thing that we have not, sadly not touched upon, hopefully on another debate, is the social media. We need to talk about that. You know, the social media, everything, our political debate has migrated online. Whether we like it or not, we need to talk about big data, we need to talk about micro-targeting. This is very real, and especially after the year 2012-13, when tech companies turned into advertisement companies, when they allowed us, you know, when they allowed um, big firms to target us depending on our pers you know, inclinations, let's say. If you have anti-Semitic inclinations, yeah? You, you, st you will be getting more and more anti-Semitic messages. If you have Islamophobic, maybe a potential, you get more and more of that. The algorithm of YouTube that does not make a difference whether you're selling extremism or an eczema cream. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a property like you know, any other. So what I'm trying to say is that whole shift, that whole transformation has also affected our political debates. Okay. I'm going to bring Matthew in briefly, because you did talk about tech a little bit, but I think you're quite cynical, I think, about the extent to which algorithms are dictating our views. Yeah, so, well, I, I'm open to the idea that what big tech social media is doing is exacerbating polarization, but what we've been given is a different line, which is it's a causal factor in why people voted in Trump or Brexit, and that is incredibly misleading. I've read every study, for example, that's been done on the UK referendum, um, and you would be incredibly hard-pressed to put a convincing case together to suggest that what people were seeing on Facebook and Twitter was as influential as we've been led to believe. And we've also conveniently forgotten the fact in this conversation about big tech is that it's a very low-trust environment. Only 30% of people trust what they see on social media. People are not these kind of, you know sort of non-inquisitive lemmings walking around being told how to vote by certain parties. The, the and 2016 being, so. elections was the first elections in America where the majority of the voters got their information through social media. Yeah, and but that, that, but that was doesn't a massive mean they trust change. it. But, but I think we need to clarify <laughs> one thing. Um, what we're experiencing right now is a very complex phenomenon. And it would be a mistake to try to reduce it to one single cause. So I'm not saying that social media is the cause, but we need to talk about the shifts yeah. in social media. Um, and it's not only people are on the, on the liberal left are saying this. Many conservative thinkers like David Trump, they are expressing their worry that um, almost 30% of America is living in an information ghetto. You know, that should concern all of us. All right. Where do we get our knowledge from? I, I want to get some more questions all, in. We're all being so nostalgic about the previous age. When you only read The Guardian or when you only read The no, Daily no, Mail, no, you really were in a ghetto. Is, now you have, because this, of social media, nothing, people thrusting opposing views This has nothing to do with you. nostalgia, but here's the, here's the difference. This yeah. has nothing to do with nostalgia. You know, when you read The Guardian or The Sun, as a reader, we know more or less what to expect. We have our own personal filter. The algorithm of YouTube gives the impression of being neutral. The, you know, we all accept that the printing machine had a huge impact on, you know, on the culture, on politics, on society, but we find it very difficult to accept that the, the, the revolution, these changes in, trans, in communication technology are also having my, my a massive, are definitely not massive working then impact because I get very different on us. Views thrust and at I me think as citizens, as citizens, we, all of us, doesn't matter which party we're voting for, but we need to keep an eye on social media. Okay, I'm gonna, that's, that was a great discussion. I want to get some more questions in. I'm going to go on the left. Uh, number four over there, yes. There's a gentleman there, is there anybody? Then there's a gentleman here, number two, yes. Great. Okay, my question is for Matthew Goodwin specifically. You gave a stat that, well, liberals were three times as likely to be upset if someone from the opposite camp came home to dinner. Any idea why? Okay, and... There was a gentleman up here. Um, Elif, uh, you just said that YouTube sort of promote their algorithms to be neutral, but I would argue that the algorithms are actually promoted to tell you, kind of give you the idea, that the impression that they understand what you want. Uh, how do you feel that that is sort of promoting populism and liberalism? Okay, any more on that side? 
Yes, one more there. Number two. There you go. Hi, yeah, there's one question I had, which was, is what we're looking at as a dearth of quality of politician? <laughs> if you, over the, last, over the last 10 years, I can't think of any true strategic thinker that's come out with breakthrough policy. The referendum was a per perfect opportunity for people to think about how to be strategic and how to reinvent the future of this country, and clearly no one's done it quite yet. Okay. Matthew, I'm going to go with you first, because there was that very specific question, why do you think Liberals are three times as likely to be upset if someone yeah. of the opposite persuasion comes home? Um, there was a question about algorithms and YouTube and the dearth of quality politicians. Mm. Well, on the, uh, the first question, uh, we haven't talked at all really about some of the achievements of, of liberalism, and one of the achievements has been some pretty remarkable uh, social uh, change in a very short period of time. To give you one example, in about 50 years in the US, the percentage of Americans um, who have gone from disapproving of intergroup marriage to approving um, in about 50 years has gone from 90% disapproving to about 90% approving in an incredibly short space of time. And we forget how quickly uh, views uh, can change. But, but now, we're faced with findings similar to the one I mentioned in the UK, where you have nearly 40% of Democrats saying they would have a fundamental problem if a relative brought home a Republican uh, to, to, to have dinner and you know, introduce a Republican into the family, which is a reflection of how political polarization is quickly, uh, I think, eclipsing um, some of those traditional arenas uh, of, of division. Why is it happening? Um, this is the elephant in the room, I think, that runs through this debate, which is that we now have a growing number of studies, some of which I, I shared on, uh, on Twitter, and it, I, it's always met with what I call the silence, which is nobody really, really sort of engages with, with them, um, but that we have a growing number of experimental studies suggesting that liberal orientated uh, people are very intolerant, can be very intolerant of political views and beliefs that are different to their own. And it may well be a fact that we've, it may be to do with what we've hinted towards, that the self-selection into high prestige, high status educational institutions uh, also exacerbates the tendency to self-select into social networks that don't particularly challenge uh, views alongside uh, the fact that, to be frank, a lot of liberals have benefited from a media, social, and economic uh, consensus that has largely supported and defended their values. And I think over the last two or three years, a lot of people who were used to feeling like winners, um, in, at least in the political world, have, for the first time in their lives, started to feel like losers. And I think that's been especially challenging. And I think it's brought out a lot of, um, a lot of those underlying psychological dispositions. But the research on that, I think, is out there, and I think we do need to take it quite seriously. John. Uh, I'd like particularly to um, address the gentleman who uh, felt that politicians are a lower and lesser quality now, and there was quite a lot of applause about it. Um, I, I've been reporting on, on British politics um, since really about 1970 for a time I was uh, the BBC political editor in the early days of the Thatcher uh, government, first Thatcher government. Um, my, my impression is not that we nowadays uh, have midgets and dwarves. Am I allowed to say that? I don't know. <laughs> We're not allowed, to, we, we don't have politicians of restricted stature um, uh, compared with the giants that once uh, bestrode the, the, the nation. Um, not true, what has changed uh, is the way in which we perceive them and we're allowed to perceive them. Uh, Harold Wilson was a man who surrounded himself with, uh, with, with defenses, which made it really difficult to see him as a, as a person. Same was true of, of Harold Macmillan, although he was uh, just slightly before, before my time. Um, it, it, weirdly, it was Margaret Thatcher that, 
that did away with a lot of that, that kind of distance that politicians placed between themselves and, and, and ordinary people. We were permitted to see Margaret Thatcher at a closer, uh, a, a closer to than, for instance, we had with her predecessors. And as, as it's gone on, uh, so we've been able to see our politicians more and more closely. We've stuck them under the microscope. We've seen every single failing and fault that they have. But believe me, as somebody who's, who's uh, um, gone, the, gone the rounds with them, uh, there's not much difference between politicians today and politicians in the 1960s. It's just that we're not allowed, we weren't allowed to examine them as closely uh, as we are now. Bit of a defence though, I'm going to make Dan wait. Uh, Elise. Yeah, um, I'm going to pick up on that question as well. Uh, there's a story that I, I like actually um, about John McCain and obviously I have lots of, I had lots of disagreements with his politics but also respect for, for the man himself. And while he was running his campaign uh, against Obama at the time, um, there were lots of times when people in the audience stood up and they would say all kinds of things about Obama and he would challenge his own audience. And in one of those occasions, um, in a town hall, a woman stood up and she said that she did not find Obama trustworthy because he's a Muslim, he's an Arab, uh, he's not trustworthy. So he used these, she used uh, those words. And John McCain's response was, Madam, first of all, what you're saying is misinformation. You know, you have been uh, guided by misinformation. And secondly, Obama is a decent uh, father. He's a decent citizen. He, he's a decent politician. We just happen to have disagreements on fundamental issues. And that is what this campaign is about. So the reason why I'm mentioning this is because that kind of agreement and respect for basic democratic norms is what we're losing today. And this is the danger of populism that we need to underline. You know, this constant hatred, this constant tension and questioning the very truth, the very the foundations of liberal democracy. So I am as critical as you are. If, do I agree with the proposition that is the liberal elite, are the elites themselves, whether they are conservative or liberal or populist, the elites to be held responsible for all this inequality and how they turn the blind eye to all that you know, unfairness that has been going on for decades? Yes, I am very critical of that. But do I agree with the proposition that we can generalize? We have to be very careful about that because what we're losing right now is this very basis, you know, the basic norms that at the time many politicians with integrity um, were aware of and tried to defend. With regards to the algorithms, I find it a very important issue. Um, I lived in America, I lived in Boston, Michigan, and then Arizona. I lived in Tucson, very close to Mexican border. It was just eye-opening experience for me after 9-11. And this was a time when um, radio hosts were saying uh, the liberals have four pillars of evil. They would say the, the media, science, academia, and one by one we're going to replace it. That kind of discourse started in, in the early 2000s, you know, to build an alternative digital world out there, to build an alternative media, to build an alternative science. There's, there is an effort there that has been going on for a long time. And just to give you a few uh, numbers, the number of uh, people following white supremacist, white nationalist accounts on Twitter between the year 2012 and 2015 increased 600% in America. Um, all of that should worry us because of the way how we are bombarded by, you know, we don't even know how to deal with a bombardment of information, but now we are also bombarded with misinformation. I'm going to briefly ask Dan to talk about we just can't get the politicians these days. And then I want to say we're well, running out of time. If, I want to get some we more can't, questions. it's your fault, right? I mean, in a democracy, you get the politicians you deserve. I, I'm soon going to be able to say our fault because I fought my last election, I'm glad to say, and will be uh, returning to civilian life. But I uh, perhaps presuming on that uh, outgoing status, I'm going to do something which is never popular, which is to mount a defense of my uh, existing not for much longer profession. 
very often when we complain about politicians, what we're complaining about is the inability to work out the contradictory impulses that exist in any polity, in any state. You know, we want to have lower taxes and we want to have higher spending on our pet projects. We want to have uh, less immigration and we want to have the growth that comes from more immigration. We, we don't want any new houses built near us, but we want to be able to afford houses and the politicians just don't listen. But of course they can't reconcile fundamentally irreconcilable ambitions. And of course it, it's part of their function just to be the people that get blamed in that situation. I want to say one other thing. Uh, following on from Elif's last point about the, 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 the number of people now following white supremacist websites, I think one of the issues that is driving the current rise of authoritarianism is our obsession with identity politics in general and racial politics in particular. And the, the, this idea that the alt-right and the woke left are kind of opposites, I don't think really stands up to scrutiny. They're both determined to see everything through the prism of race. And it seems to me the most fundamentally illiberal ideal of all, whether it comes from the far right or whether it comes from people who call themselves progressives, to say that the most important way to judge someone is not by their kindness or their intelligence or their courtesy or their generosity or their courage, but by their physiognomy. And Dan, I'm going to stop you there because it is a whole another conversation, one I know that uh, Intelligence Squared are going to have very soon, so do come along to that one because I want to get some more <laughs> questions in. Yes, number one... and. There's also one at the front here and one at the back there. Um, you've all seemingly criticised liberalism as well as populism, quite justifiedly so populism. I'm sure everyone agrees. Um, as a young leftist and political person, I personally feel very disillusioned by all the political options when it comes to voting. I'm like, who do I vote for? And I'm sure there's... I know a lot of my peers agree with me on that front. So if we can't vote for populism, which is appealing in many ways for disillusioned young people because it offers a sense of unity and harmony, as you said, do you think that liberalism needs to be redefined or that we need a positive alternative to populism? Brilliant. Thank you very much. And there was another one at the back somewhere, yeah. Um, thank you for the healthy debate uh, around liberalism and populist within a nation state. I think one thing I'd like to get your viewpoint on is uh, an external viewpoint when you look at the rise of populism across the nation states. Um, and perhaps to frame it into a question, do you think you would rely on the thinking, the ideology of liberalism to help ease the tensions of rising populism across nation states? Okay, and there was, I know there was one more hand up here. Mine's quite a quick one. So do you think we're at risk of overcomplicating the debate uh, by turning it into this kind of ideological thing? And actually another definition for populism and liberalism is poor people and rich people. And actually the simple kind of inequality growth is driving um, more populism through simple kind of economic factors. Great. Okay, so someone who's disillusioned by the political op options, does liberalism need to be redefined or should there be a positive alternative to populism? Should we rely on the ideology of liberalism to fight populism, or is another way of thinking about all of this simply poor versus rich? John, I'm going to go with you first. Um, I mean, these are such different subjects, aren't they? It's a bit difficult to sort of get a, a, a one-size-fits-all answer. And we have only got three minutes. I, just, <laughs> I, I do think, uh, perhaps I can take the, 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 the first of the questions, but you know, I do think, and... Believe me, once, I mean, it must be impossible for, for, you know, to, to, to even conceive of it, but I, I was young and I, uh, <laughs> I, and I think that there is something often in us when we're young, um, which is really a, a terribly kind of self-indulgent and soft about it. Politics is as we are always being told, the art of, of having to choose between difficult solutions and possible solutions. And I think it's important uh, for, for, for young people, not that they'll do it, uh, not that I did it, um, to, to, to kind of man up about it and accept that you're never going to find perfection. I mean, this was what, what happened with with, with uh, um, 
Jeremy Corbyn, that people thought that he was perfect. And then, surprise, surprise, they found that like everybody else, he had to make compromises. And that then the, some of the support at least started to fall away. That's, that's a, a, a really naive approach to politics. You have to accept that these things are difficult, that uh, they're awkward, and that there isn't a kind of 100% solution, and never, never will be. Dan, if we can keep, we'll ask all of you to keep it fairly brief. Stanley Baldwin was Prime Minister for much of the interwar period. Very unideological, undogmatic Tory. And he was asked towards the end of his life whether he'd been influenced by any particular thinker. And rather surprisingly, because he wasn't the sort of chap who read books very much, he, he said, yes, yes, I was. I was very influenced as a young man by the teaching of Sir Henry Maine. And it was through reading his works that I came to understand that all human progress is a move from status to contract. And then he paused, frowning, and said, or was it the other way around? <laughs> now, the story is a, is a little illustration of how even most brilliant ideas become over-smooth through overuse. But just pause for a second and think about what that means, the move from status to contract. That instead of having our relations with each other mediated by birth, or caste or tradition, we are all treated as autonomous individuals able to make freestanding contracts one with another on an issue by issue basis. That for me is the essence of a liberal society. For me it's the, 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 what, a, what an open society rests on. And it has elevated our species to a pinnacle of wealth and happiness that would have recently been unimaginable. If by liberalism, we mean defending that supremacy of the individual, then it's still the best idea on the market. If instead of allowing liberalism to be corroded by all of these ideas of identity politics uh, uh, and you know, uh, uh, elitism and so on, if we just restore our confidence in the core idea that the individual should be elevated above the collective and that the rules should be elevated above the rulers, then I think that is the answer both to the populist challenge and indeed to the elitism which spurred it in the first place. Elif. You know, mem memory is an in in interesting thing and it's an important part of, of this entire political debate actually. One of the most interesting researches that was done recently asked uh, people of different age groups on both sides of the Atlantic, how important is it for you to live in a democracy? And interestingly, um, people above a certain age answered that question in a more positive way. They said it was crucial for them to live in a liberal democracy. Among the millennials, uh, it, was, it was a bit more tricky, the results, and a large portion of them said maybe it wasn't that important. My worry is, uh, when I look at the, at the numbers in the UK, in Germany, in US, people who are now situating themselves especially among young people, on the far right or the far left, those numbers are increasing. You know, in the UK, it has doubled. In a place like Sweden, it has tripled. Why? Because people are disillusioned. They're not happy with this status quo, obviously. And they're very right not to be happy. So those grievances, those resentments are very real, and we have to deal with those problems honestly and frankly and without any delay. But at the same time, I think we need to understand what we have here, you know, liberal democracy, especially if you come from a country where there has never been a proper liberal democracy, maybe you understand its value better. And there are many people all across the world, in Brazil, in Venezuela, in Turkey, for them, being a liberal or being a democrat, it's not a theoretical question. People, people risk their lives, you know, for voicing these opinions. Uh, and unfortunately, even in Europe, this is happening. As you know, the liberal mayor of a, of a town in Poland has been uh, killed recently. Again in Poland, 14 women very recently have been uh, arrested and their crime is to open just a banner that says no to fascism. They were beaten um, by ultranationalist groups and then the police came and instead of arresting the ultranationalist groups, the police arrested the women and now they're going to be, they have to go through a trial. So in many parts of the world, it is not easy to say I'm a liberal, I'm a democrat and to voice these opinions. 
And what I'm trying to say is maybe we have to appreciate the system that we have. Um, definitely liberal democracy is not a bed of roses, but it is the, it's a better system than any other regime that humanity could come up with so far. But what I'm referring to here Briefly. is things like rule of law, separation of powers, free media, minority rights. These are the things we need to protect. At the same time, we need to renew this system because it's not working. Okay. We need to deal with inequality. While protecting the basics, we can reform and renew the system, and we must do that now. Matthew, very briefly, because I've now crashed the bulletin and ruined the arches or something. So, <laughs> very briefly, you should address those quick questions, and then we'll have one quick little run-through at the end. Um, it's all in the book. It's all in the book. <laughs> that was good. Okay, I'm going to ask each of you, before um, Matthew sells the book out the front, um, to come back to the main question. I think we have addressed much of this as we've gone along, but just in 30 seconds each, do you blame liberals for po the rise of populism, and is populism here to stay? Dan? No. To both of those? Yeah. Absolutely. Matt? Yes and yes. Uh, and th 20 seconds as to why. Um, if you can do one thing after tonight's debate, get hold of a marvellous essay by Margaret Canavan, who sadly passed away last year, and she wrote a really good piece on the two faces of populism. And the reason I, I, I tell everybody to read that essay is because Canavan argued that we need to stop thinking about populism as if it's alien to democracy, as if it's a, a disease that needs to be cured. Her thesis was far more compelling, which was that populism is embedded at the heart of our democratic life. You cannot get rid of populism because it thrives off of the tensions that exist between the politics of skepticism, of managerialism, of technocracy, and the politics of faith, of redemption, of salvation, of taking back control, of making the nation great again. And it's the tension between those two styles that gives birth to populism time and time and time again. We can't get rid of it. We can only live, uh, we can only learn, sorry, to live with it. So I think it will be around for the rest of our lives and, and then some. Elif, very briefly. Uh, populism is going to stay with us for a long time and actually every case, uh, every precedent that we look at has shown us once they come to power, they do consolidate their power, they do crush civil society and in the long run they damage democracy. Um, so it is inherently anti-democratic, um, but we have to deal with it. Um, I do blame the inequality, I do blame the liberal elite, also the conservative elite and the populist elite, but I don't blame uh, the university student who might have a liberal values, liberal ideas, but can't even afford her tuition, or a teacher who has liberal values, but can't even, you know, uh, pay, pay her rent. These are the people that we should be very careful about not blaming, and we need to talk about how the elite have been disconnected from the real problems of our times. John. I want to end on a really, really gloomy note. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's liberalism or liberals that are responsible for populism. I think it's a movement of history and that we've had it good for a very, very, very long time through all my lifetime. And I'm afraid, I think we're heading into the shadows uh, much more where people like, like Erdogan uh, are, are starting to control things much, much more than they have been. I hope I'm wrong, uh, but I've, I've got a nasty feeling I'm right. Sweet dreams, everybody. Uh... <laughs> John Simpson, Alif Shafak, Matthew Goodwin, Daniel Hannan, thank you very much. <laughs>